In today's lesson, we will cover a static malware analysis. And this lesson is the second lesson in a multi-part series, so you should have uh, viewed the first lesson, which was an overview of malware analysis, which gives you a broad introduction to the types of uh, procedures that will be running to help identify whether a file is malware or not, and if so, what it does. And so you want to make sure that you view that lesson first because it gives you a good background of what we're going to do. And in the remaining lessons, we will walk specifically through the procedures that will help you identify malware and its behavior on a system. And specifically, we'll be looking at a file that constitutes malware. And in fact, yeah, some administ actually, you can look at this, the file that we'll be using as malware is two different ways. Is one, it's a great little tool, and in another, uh, system administrators don't allow it on their system because they do consider it malware because it's it's it can be used to subvert uh, communications across the network and a specifically access control to communications across the network. Recall from our first lesson that static malware analysis tries to determine file characteristics without running it. We want to look at the file type. We can look at the contents of the file, even though it's a binary file. And we can look at other types of information, such as the modified, changed, and access times, as well as, as well as the hash of the file to see if we can try to identify whether the file is malware or not. And, and so we want to look at the uh, modified, changed, and access times. Why do we want to do that first? Well. You know, we, we've used the stat command previously and tell, tells us all the uh, metadata information about the file, uh, the physical and logical size, the modified change in access times. Well, let's say that if we ran the determine the type of file and we ran the file command first, what would happen? Well, it's going to change the access time. So if we can, we want to run stat first to get this information because all the other, other commands are going to change this access time right here, the date and time. And so we want to do that first. And what I've done is, is that I've upped the complexity of this example just to show you some of the things, some of the uh, hiding techniques that may be used by the bad guy in order to, uh, to remain hidden on the system. So again, what I'm showing you here is going to be a, a little different than what I'm going to give you for your first assignment because I will give you the binary files and I'll give you some associated information with those files. And so you should follow along with the procedure that I've listed here. Um, but in this case, I've made it a little more complex to show you the, the capabilities and some of the things you might need to think about if you get an intruder that use some more sophisticated techniques to hide what they're doing. So, we've looked here and we know that there's a suspicious open port. Um, listening on 1234, that's not a, a standard port and we can go out to the internet and search for that. Uh, we can also go to a file within the Linux system to try to determine uh, what port 1234 is, well-known ports, Unfortunately, right now, I don't have internet access. That's the joys of working in an academic community is sometimes your, your internet goes down, so we won't be able to do that. But suffice to say, that port should not be open because as a network administrator or security administrator, I should know what ports should be listening. And I know all of these ports are valid ports except the 1234. So let's get out of here. Type Q, let's clear the screen. So, if we don't have an internet connection, let's go to the Etsy directory and let's look at the file called Services. And what this is, is it's a list of all the well known ports and their associated uh, services. And it shows you the uh, well known port numbers. Obviously, anything greater 1024 and above will be usually uh, client side services which are randomly selected uh, by the operating system when you want to connect to something else. But these are the well-known ports. If we hit the forward slash and search for 1234, let's see if anything shows up. 
No, it doesn't. But if you want to scroll down through here, for example, uh, this is a uh, very good reference that indicates uh, the port numbers, uh, whether it's TCP or UDP, and what ports they run under. For example, here you see POP3 is the POP3 server, post office protocol, and it runs over port 110, both TCP and UDP. Okay, so we know 1234, 1234 is not in there. So the next thing we can do under these circumstances, we know that there's something running over port 1234, so we can use the PS command and we can look for port 1234 and see if we can find out any other information about it. And so let's run PS AUX and then let's grep for 1234. Got it? So we're going to do a, a uh, excuse me, the listing of our process is running and then search for 1234. <coughs> Okay, whoa, this was run by root. Okay, I'm root. I know I didn't run that, so somebody probably broke in, but let this besides the point. But you see here is on this line, it's uh, 28352, and it was says it was run from a current directory dash L1234. So I don't know what CN, CN, there, there is no CN. I know that. There is no command CN, so somebody's been messing around on here. We see when it was run, and how long it's been running, uh, where the service is run from, terminal 1, which should be my computer, my terminal, that is, it wasn't, it wasn't uh, done from a, a different terminal. And so CN-L, hmm, I think that's an L, maybe it's a 1. It's almost like CN-L1234. Okay, so what we need to do is, is we need to search for CN-1234 and let's write down the service number, the, uh, the, the process number, 28352. Let's hit clear here. And let's see if we can find that file because it, it was it was called locate cn. Well, let's pipe that to less. Okay. And I and I'm doing and I know exactly what I did, but what I'm doing here is showing you the, the methodology you might use. So I'm using the locate command. I could also use the find command and see if we can locate anything that, that's the cn command. Oh, and I don't find it. So the other thing we could do is to use the find command, but I'm not going to do that here. But what I'm going to show you, and this is covered in in my book chapter on computer forensics methods and procedures, is that you have something called a pseudo file system. And you'll find that in the proc directory that runs off of the, that is located off the root directory. And what this shows you well, let's just do an ls. What this shows you is the running state of the system. And so essentially whenever you issue some of these commands it will read this information from the proc directory. And so what we're interested in is you see these you see these this blue over here and hopefully you're not blue green colorblind but the the numbers over here notice that one and notice that these are uh, sorted numerically. You have a one, two, three. What these are, are are directories that are associated with each of the processes running. So we always know that one will be the init command which initializes the system. So notice this is first and we could go back and look at the running processes and tell what two and three and four are. But we're interested in 28352. 28.352, there it is. So there's a directory associated with that. So let's gain the focus again and go to 28.352. And the directory is full of useful information.
at the command line, and actually we, we already saw what the command line was. And we see simply that's what we saw before, is that somebody issued from the directory, uh, whatever that was, the current directory, cn-l1234. That wasn't of much help, but let's look at the NUMA pseudo x is NUMA maps file, which provides us some more information about what's going on. And let's read through here. It was saying default file home PC dot Firefox. Okay, that's weird because this appears to be a hidden directory because notice that it starts with a dot. Notice each time down here. This shows us the memory and all the other files that that are used by the command. Notice that it's it's got some files down here, some standard libraries like PCR e.so.3.1.2 and so on. So it looks like it's using some libraries, but it looks like that this file cn was located in the hidden directory dot Firefox under home PC. And you notice that it says it was deleted. Oh crap. That's not good. Okay, it's been deleted. Okay, that doesn't make any sense. It's running. The process is running. Well you know what? You can, you can start up a process and it can remain in memory forever and you can delete that file and it will still remain in memory and it will run until that process is deleted. So somebody's run this file cn from the .firefox x directory and then deleted it as a way of hiding. Okay, so now at least we know where the file resided. The locate command didn't find it. So let's go back to the home directory and go to Firefox. Okay, somebody misspelled Firefox, obviously, right? And they also made it the hidden directory. Let's do an ls-al to show the hidden files. Yikes, there's nothing. Oh, we're in big trouble, right? Well, as it turns out, we're not. We can go back to the proc directory, 28352. And notice that there's a file called exe. This is the contents of the file that is running in memory right now. So even though somebody's deleted the file, as long as it's still running, we can capture that memory here and output it to a file. I'll say that again. As long as the process is running, as soon as the process is stopped, this directory and its contents goes away. So as long as that's running, we can capture this the memory of whatever the running file was and output that to a file. And so let's go back and make a directory called evidence here. And so we want to cat that file, exe, to a file in our evidence directory. And let's call this Capture ex capture exe and we've captured that file and there's our file now what we can do is we can run the stat command against that file and look at information about it the the file size is 31296. It's a regular file. The number of blocks it takes up. There's the IDO number 134210. We can look at its permissions. The user ID, yikes, it was associated with me as well as PC. And the reason that that is is because I'm running its root. Then you see the modified access and change times here. Notice it's dash 4 means it's uh, Eastern Time and that we're running in Daylight Savings Time and it was last modified, accessed, and changed on 5-9-2011. Okay, the next thing that we can do is we can run the file and by the way you'd want to output this information uh, to a file. And let's go ahead and let's do this. Capture exe greater than capture exe file info 
And now we want to run the file command against this to find out what kind of file it is. OK, this gives us some good information. It's an executable file. It was compiled for an x86 64-bit architecture. Uh, this is uh, version 1 of System 5 Unix, dynamically linked. It uses shared libraries. And when we go through the dynamic analysis, we'll look at that in more detail. And it's stripped of any object code, in, which makes it run faster, but also may, um, if it con contained the object code upon compilation, that might give us some more detailed information about how this works. But for right now, we know that it's stripped of the uh, object code. So now we can put that into this file. Make sure we append it to that. And now what we might want to do is to create a hash of the file. And recall that a one-way cryptographic hash uniquely identifies the contents of a file. I mean, obviously there is no file named CN. Obviously somebody has renamed it, but what we can do is to run an MD5 sum, or you can do a SHA-1 or whatever. It might be easier if you're going to be using this on the internet to try to identify the file to use the MD5 sum. And so we'll do this and we will uh, run that. So we see that the MD5 sum is this number right here. Let's go back and let's append that that information. Now we'll see what we've got here. Well, let me clear this so it's a little easier to see. And so we have the results of stat, the results of file, the results of running the md5 sum command. And right here is where you might want to go and to copy and paste this within the Google search engine and to see if you can come up with a file hash that matches this and if it does match you know what kind of file it is and right now I don't believe I've got internet connection still um, great no I don't okay so we'll have to we'll have to keep on without it okay so the next command we want to run back up here is we can run the strings command. And again, what strings does is that it strips out the human readable ASCII characters and we can, um, the, the default number of contiguous ASCII characters that we'll output is I believe uh, four or five characters. Let's take a look at that with the man page for strings. And then we can go back through and see if there's any unique content in there that will help us identify what file it is. So let's clear this and let's run man strings. Okay, let's run strings dash h. Okay, my internet is back up, so what we can do is is and unfortunately I don't have Uh, the utilities installed here, VMware utilities, so I'll type out the first few characters of the MD5 to see if we can find it. And this is what I received. Your search did not match any document. So that hash 150.0f, okay, did not match any string on Google. So we're going to have to go deeper in here and do some more work to find out what it is. So, as it turns out, the if we type strings dash h, if we type man strings, as it turns out for this system, the strings command is not uh, on this computer. If we type strings dash h, it tells us that the program strings can be found in the following packages 
bin util, so what we need to do is to install the strings command. And that's really interesting because and it's installing it. And that's kind of one of the things that you run into. This is the first time I've ever run a system that didn't have strings automatically on it. So I guess the server version here uh, doesn't install strings by default, or doesn't install the binary utilities command by default. Now we can run man strings. And we've got strings. Uh, notice here, there's a min length that you can indicate in here so that it doesn't pick up some of the shorter text strings. And notice that you can use min length or dash n, the minimum length. The default is four characters, four ASCII characters. And so what we'll do is we'll bump that up to, uh, let's say, five. Okay, so we know how strings works. So we'll type strings in 5, and let's pipe that to less. We'll obviously want to output that into a file, but for now let's, let's just look at this. A lot of this will be compilation information, compile information, and we can scroll down with the J key or by page with the spacebar. And a lot of these are calls to libraries, the libraries that can be used. Oh, here we go. A nice little help file. Usage NC. And so this is a little uh, help information that can be output for the file. NC is the netcat command, and that's called the Swiss Army Knife of Tools. It allows you to read bytes and write bytes over an open port. Uh, let me see, notice in here we see the L dash L listen mode for inbound connects. So obviously somebody has created a little server here over port 1234. So so we found out what it is. It's Netcat and, and that's considered a very useful tool and I've used that quite a bit, uh, especially in forensics to copy things over the uh, internet if it doesn't need to be encrypted. Although there is a, a similar tool called CryptCat, C-R-Y-P-T, CAT, that will use encryption to run bytes over a network connection. But in this instance it's just a simple Netcat and doesn't do any encryption. So somebody is able to open a source port to listen in on port 1234. Well, that goes against uh, acceptable use policy, so somebody has violated that. But that isn't the purpose of this lesson. This lesson was to use uh, a static analysis to try to identify what type of file it is, and now we have enough information that we know at least what's listening on that open port. And so in our next lesson, you will, uh, we will use a dynamic analysis to actually run this command. And actually it's already running, so let's don't stop it. Let's, let's see what it's doing. At first, um, just to see if there's anything running over port 1234. And then after that, we will take the file and we'll pretend that it's been stripped out of any help information. So, because this was this was very easy, it's uh, you know this is a, a well-known command utility, and uh, obviously if somebody's trying to hide what they're doing, they won't uh, include the usage in here, although they might. But we'll go back and we will run netcat and use some of the other commands to to identify the types of dynamic behavior that is caused by running the netcat command.